the vision. And, and we've had a few over the years, you know, the typical um, state of the church address a uh, few over the years. Um, a lot of you missed this very first one. It's from 2012, and that was before almost all of you that are coming here. So we want, I just want to kind of go over some of the history, and we want to see where we've come from and where we're going. So we're going to be celebrating the vision. The vision of South Troy is to know, show, no, now I read this one, to know, grow, show, and go. Jesus love to our families, our communities, to, our, to the whole area. So we want to continue to talk about that. In South Troy, um, in March and April of 2010, when we started, um, God called us here about that. Our, our lead pastor at Austin, at Crane Chapel, asked us to pray and to see if God wanted us to come here. So Gary and I drove around the community and we prayed. Um, we sat behind that log cabin a number of days and just prayed and to see if God really wanted us here. So we didn't have a key to the building at the time. So we couldn't come in and pray, so we were outside in the parking lot. And so then in September of that year, um, by then we said yes, and we, we came, and then we realized one of the first jobs was to clean out the basement. So we cleaned out the basement, and our son that had worked, worked for a Jewish um, disaster relief organization, he came with his trailer and got um, in the newspaper because we had a Jewish truck out there that said Nakama, Jewish, and they were helping us clean out the basement of South Troy. So um, Dan and Jean and, and Gary and our family um, were all downstairs in the basement. Had this huge dumpster full of stuff. Got all cleaned out. And we started having Thursday night services, which didn't get done. But we tried. We tried that first. And then in May of 2011, we had our first bike lesson. I mean, we had a pretty good turnout that first year. And so we thought that was one of the ways God wanted us to minister. And then we went on to June. We painted the outside of the church, me and Dorian and Jennifer. <coughs> And Luth even helped a little bit, and a couple of the other area kids got on the first house, and he came and helped. And we tried to, and we painted the outside of the church. <clears throat> and then we got the, and then Crane Chapel came and put in a bathroom for us. One of the men at Crane Chapel came um, and put in a bathroom, because up till um, uh, September of 2012, we had an outhouse out here. Um, September 11, 2011, we began monthly Sunday services. And then our goals for that coming year were to be an integral part of the community for 2012. We wanted to reach out to Zumbra Falls and Millville and Hammond and Plainview and North Rochester, Elgin and Orinoco. We wanted to start small groups that fall. We wanted to start Children's Sunday School in the fall of 2012. And we wanted to skip to two services by the fall of 2013. Then we put up a billboard and we got that paid for. And we had Easter, I got the food, messed you up, didn't I? Um, that first Easter, we had 40 people attend, and we had launch services, and we started every Sunday services. Um, May 2nd, we had our second bike blessing, and we had high socials and cookouts and hymn sings, trying to get people to come to the church to be interested, to, to just come in the door and decide if that's what they wanted to do. So then we, um, like I said, then we had our goals coming up, and I think I already named them all, but go ahead and put them up, to be an integral part of the community and small groups, and to have two services in children's Sunday school. The reality, we called it our marching orders coming that year. In Easter, we had our first service. Um, some of this is going to repeat. September 8th of 2012, we became an official church plant. The district wanted to see if we were going to have any traction at all, because we started with just the four of us. We wanted to see if we had anybody really interested in making it a church. Um, and then September 16th, we had Back to Church Sunday our first one, and we started our children's ministry on September 16th. Uh, we had our first movie night in November, and we had our first Christmas Eve service, all in 2012. All those were our first things happening. And then we moved on to our ministry. We grew to um, some of the things that we wanted to do. We wanted to offer Financial Peace University. We wanted to grow to 50 on Sundays. Um, we wanted to offer another children's class. We, we knew we would need more volunteers. And we wanted to continue to minister to Zumbra Falls and become financially independent by this year. Um, as we grew, what some of the other things that we were able to do on the, in, in the church was we painted the entire sanctuary before Easter that year. We put in a suspended ceiling. We finished the walls and the storeroom and the furnace area. The basement is totally different from those first days, any of you that were here in the very beginning. Even that first Back to Church Sunday. Um, it's totally a different area down there. We put in a new door so we could see outside and see when people came. 
Um, and so it had a window. We put shades up so they all finally match. Well, pretty close anyway. Um, and then we worked on the sanctuary windows and we actually, ins and then we also put insulation in the church in 2014. And so, um, what we're looking at is, then last year I preached when I talked about our vision and where, how far we'd come and where we were going. We talked about East, our first Easter Sunday, we had over 40. The next Easter Sunday, we had 68. The next Easter Sunday was 78. And last year, we had 92. God has been working. God is continually blessing and providing for us, and we believe that he desires that we continue to serve and grow this new church. We see great things in the future. We desire to be an integral part of the community, as we've said. We have been working with these communities and reaching out in all directions. As we continue to do that, we continue to want to reach people that don't have a church. We don't want to be church stealers. We don't want to take people and we don't want to take, take what they call them, old people, people that like to bounce around. We, you know, those ones, we, we, I've been encouraging them to stay where they are and to really help their own churches. And we've lost a few that way. We've had a few go back to their own churches because they felt like that's where their family wanted to be in. That's what we encouraged them to do. One, Dave Ryan shared that one day after service. He goes, you know, you're right. I should be going where my family's going. So he says, that's where I'm going to go. And I said, that's good. That's where you should be. Your wife shouldn't be going to church alone. Go with her. So that's where they are. So it happened to Joe and Pam as well. And that's okay. We want them to be where they're being fed. And, and especially Joe and Pam live clear on the other side of Rochester. For them to come clear over here, if they like something in town, that's great. So here's what we want. We don't want to steal people, but we want to reach people that have given up on church. People that haven't been going for a long time. People that are just that have never been to church. We're doing that now, and, and we're continually desiring to do that. There are a lot of people in our community that aren't going to church on Sunday, and we can continue to reach out to them in the days ahead. Our vision for this church is to be a vital living group that loves people around us and makes a difference in our community. We're doing that through the Backpack Food Program right now. We're doing it through the grocery shower, showers that we've had in the fall and the May baskets for shut-ins in the spring. We also are providing for the needs of families during funerals and weddings and, sh and baby showers as well. We want to be a part of the community so we can help others. We are celebrating South Troy's mission to know, grow, show, and go with Jesus and his love to the community around us. Our vision is to grow and invest in a next generation ministry and to reach children in the families of our area. I want to do an illustration with a bicycle with you and Sean agreed to help us out this morning. So. And Jessica allowed us to borrow her bicycle. So I think it used to be Lupe's because she got out of the garage sale last year. So I knew she had one.
Immediately, this was after the feeding of the 5,000 with Jesus and his disciples. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, go on ahead of them to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus said they had just had a huge high. They had fed 5,000 men plus women and children with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And so all those people actually had got really excited because they had just got fed a free meal that came from just a small boy's lunch. And they decided they were going to make Jesus king. They were going to put him in charge. So Jesus stepped back. It wasn't his time. He knew that wasn't the way to do it. So he sent the disciples ahead of him on a boat. He said, get in the boat and start going across the lake. Get out. You know, I need you to get out of here. Get to safety or whatever. I mean, to get out of here in this area. And then Jesus dismissed the people as well. And then he went up on a mountain to pray alone. He went up to get away. To, he needed some time. He needed to get away from the crowds. I mean, he was always surrounded by people. He was always in the middle of stuff. And he just needed time alone. And he needed time alone with his Heavenly Father. He needed time to talk to God. He knew it wasn't time to be in charge. He knew he wasn't supposed to be the king that's going to take Rome out. He knew all of that. He knew it wasn't his time to be in front. Jesus knew it was too soon, but he knew there was so much more work to do. He couldn't just get stuck with that really good day he had. He needed to go forward. So he went up on top of the mountain and took some time to pray, to get re-energized. And while he was up there praying, the disciples are going across this lake. The, Gal the Sea of Galilee is about seven miles wide. And so they're going across the lake, and they're seasoned fishermen. So they know boats, they know that they know the water. You know, they wouldn't be worried about, you know, any small things going on. But here, sometime during that time they're going across, the wind picks up and there's waves and waves and they're fighting the wind and they're making no progress whatsoever. And about the fourth watch of the night, they're only about three, three and a half miles across that lake. They're only about halfway there. And they're, they just are fighting it all the way, kind of like that bicycle up here. It isn't going forward, it's just stuck and it just wasn't going anywhere. The next thing they see at the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 and 6 in the morning, they see something coming across the water, walking towards them. Imagine that. What would you think about 3 in the morning if you saw something walking across the water? And then the waves are going, the wind is blowing. It didn't say, you know, that the water part didn't made them a nice dry path or anything. It's a storm going on, and they see us. And they, they yell out, it's a ghost. They're terrified. Now they're fighting the wind and the waves and they're scared to death. They're probably thinking this is the end. Maybe they're seeing the, you know, the death scepter. I can't even think of the word that I should use for that. But they're thinking, oh my goodness, here we go. This is it. Maybe it's our time. And they're calling out and they're scared. And Jesus goes to him with all the love and compassion like he always does. And he says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Most of us would say, easy for you to say, Jesus. You're walking on the water. We're in this boat. And we're wondering if we're going to tip over. Well, Jesus wants to do the same thing for us as well. When we begin something new, we're often afraid. We're afraid of failure. We're afraid we're going to make the wrong choices, the wrong decisions. Jesus' response is, take courage. Take courage. Something, it isn't something passive. It's something we're supposed to do. Take courage. 
Moses told that to Joshua long ago when they were entering the promised land. Moses is about to die. His time for leading Israel was over. And he was passing on the leadership to a man named Joshua, who had been with him ever since he was a young man. And he talked to him and he said, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. God told Joshua the same thing later on after Moses' death. Joshua came into the, got ready to go into the promised land. He's telling the people to get ready. And here's what God said to Joshua. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prompted and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God desires us to be courageous. Do not fear. As Jesus told his disciples in the boat, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Why didn't they need to fear? There's waves, there's wind, everything around them is telling them they're in danger. They don't know what's going to happen. But Jesus is right there saying, don't be afraid. He didn't calm the water for his walk. He walked among the waves. He walked among the wind. He was calm and unafraid despite the storm around him. And he was there for those disciples as well. He wanted them to trust him, to not be afraid, to take courage in him. And Peter, like so many of us, when Jesus said this, his eye, he said, if it's you, Lord, if it really is you, bid me to come out on that water to you. Peter's looking at Jesus and saying, prove it. Prove it. You're Jesus, I'll be able to walk on the water too. He's a little presumptuous, I guess. <laughs> a lot of us, I don't know if there's, I don't know how many of us are wired that way, but Peter was. He was a pretty, he was always fairly impulsive. But you know, he was also quite brave. He had to really believe it was Jesus too. Because when Jesus said, come, Peter put his foot out of that boat. He got out. He took a step. Jesus, all he said was come. Peter believed that it was Jesus. He was willing to take a risk with everything because Peter knew if that wasn't Jesus, he's going to drown. He's going to go straight down in the waves and the wind. But he believed it. He risked everything because he believed that was Jesus that told him to come. He believed enough to get out of the boat. Do we trust God enough to get out of the boat to take a risk? Even when the boat is being tossed around, often we trade the familiar for the future. Or it's, we trade the familiar to keep instead of for the future ahead of us. Often we sell ourselves and our faith far shorter than God has ever intended. We often enjoy the comfortable to avoid risks. Peter was willing to risk it all. He had to believe in Jesus to get out of that boat. He had to really trust him. And Jesus said one word. He said, come. He didn't promise he wasn't going to drown. He didn't promise, well, I'll catch you if you fall. He didn't say anything other than one word, come. No, it's not like when we have, <clears throat> you know, you remember those days when you had little toddlers? And you didn't just say, okay, and then just push them out there. You said, come on, we're right here. You can do it. You can do it. We encourage them and we try to help them. We try to help them to, to make that decision to trust us to come. Jesus just said, come. Peter got up and he obeyed. Peter began walking on the water. Imagine walking on water. Have any of you ever walked on water? Can you imagine walking on the water? Plus there's still the waves and the wind. It doesn't say the storm is gone yet. So there's the waves and the wind and Jesus is walking on, I mean Peter is walking on water. That was quite a rush. I bet his adrenaline was just really up there. And he says, wow. But, don't you hate butts? Have you ever had that word and just but? And that's what happened. But he turned around and he started looking at the wind and the waves. 
and he started singing. He took his eyes off of Jesus. He quit going towards Jesus, and he started singing. And he hollered out, Jesus, help me! And Jesus was right there. He was right there, and he put his hand out there, and he helped him up. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. He quit walking towards Jesus, and he let fear stop him. I have to admit, I totally understand Peter's fears. As I follow God, it seems so right. It seems so simple to trust and obey all that he wants me to do. Some days it just, wow, it's crystal clear, and I go, and, and everything seems to be going so good, and everything just works out right. Well, it don't always work that way. Some days I start worrying about it, and I think, oh, you know, what's it going to cost? What's it going to cost to follow God? And can, I, can I physically afford it? Can I financially afford it? Can I really do this? You know, just maybe God made a mistake and he's got the wrong person for this. Sometimes God's plans and the personal costs are a lot. Yeah? Actually, they're always a lot. He wants us to, to give it all to him. But he calls out to us and he says, come. If I let my eyes be diverted to the problems instead of the promise, I get worried. Yet yeah, God is so good and he's still out there reaching his hand and he brings me back on board through prayer, through reading his word, and through choosing to trust him. I can keep going forward to him. I have to go to my knees. I have to pray. I have to keep talking to him. I have to, or I, and a lot of times I'll ask other people to pray along with me when I get concerned, when things are just making me doubt what God is asking us to do or asking me to do. And I don't want to get into the depths of doubt and despair that can happen when we take our eyes off of Jesus. Jesus immediately reached out his hand to Peter. And God said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus is saying that to me as well, and to all of us as well. Why do you doubt? I know God has a plan for me. And I know he has a plan for us here at South Troy as well. We definitely have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to celebrate. Our vision has been to know, grow, show, and go with Jesus' love to those around us. Our vision involves growing and investing into a next generation ministry. Vision is a God-given ability to see possible solutions to everyday problems of life. Vision is the ability to see beyond the surface of human potential. It's not what we are, but what we desire to become. Vision is a mental picture of a desired future. It's a picture that can be seen, but not yet, of what can be. Our present belief is a reflection of our vision. There's a Japanese proverb that says, vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. Vision gives us stability. It gives us guidance. It gives us joy and excitement. The God-given vision will bring glory to God if it is for his eternal purposes. A true vision from God isn't self-seeking, but praises God and brings glory to Jesus Christ. We need to stir up the vision God has given us and continue to move forward. Like that bicycle, we can't stay healthy by staying still. It's just like a pond that's stagnant. It starts stinking and smelling, and so does a church that stays still, doesn't keep growing. We are a next generation ministry. Look around you. On Sunday mornings. Some Sunday mornings more than others, but there's children, there's families, we have young people here. It's probably, I've heard and I've been told a number of times lately, it's the hardest way to grow a church. It's by being a next, minute, next generation church. But that's what we are. Re building a church through children and young people. Because they take a lot more work, they take a lot more volunteers, and they take a lot of resources. But that's what we're committed to do. That's what God has brought us. As we've seen our church grow and change, and I'd say morph, I guess, but it has changed. It's changed from those first few years when we didn't have any children to a church that has a lot of children, where we can minister and serve. Since children and families are so important to us, we want to invest in those families in our community. We want to put our resources into these ministries and to invest in them. We've done part of that by investing in them by having Bobby and Shannon Carr join us. They're gonna be working with our children and youth ministries and young adults. That's what they're, they felt God has called them to do. And they've already started. We've had Bobby down teaching already because it just works out. It's just the way it had to work out. 
But we're, we want them, we need them to help us. And as we do this, we'll be able to reach more families in our communities as well. I want to share a vision with you. Um, the vision that God gave me. September of 2014, I was praying. It was right before the, um, our next Back to Church Sunday. I was praying fervently for, you know, for a good turnout. You know, how you, you, know, you always feel better when there's a whole bunch of people. And I was praying, and I, I read through the Bible each year. That's how I do my devotions. And I was in Isaiah 54, verses 2 and 3. And this is the verses that I, I believe with all my heart that God is calling us to do. To enlarge your house, to build an addition, spread out your home and spare no expense, for you will soon be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will occupy the nations and resettle ruined cities. I believe we need to be considering and working on the next step in that water. I need to get out of the boat again. First, let's look at, I want us to look first at how God has already blessed us. We own our own property. We have no debt. We have painted the church inside and out. We have repaired the church, and the roof and steeple. We've had the ceiling painted. We've had, we put in a new parking lot. We've had steady growth since we began. We've been recently a full house a number of times. Uh, we have started a Wednesday night kids club. We have new families. We have increased our giving. Those things have already happened. We had a farmer's market for the first time last summer. We, have, we put in a swing set a couple of years ago, a playground. God has been continually helping us to grow and to reach and to minister. We believe it's time to begin planning for the next phase at South Troy to add an addition. A multi-purpose building that will provide us with some things that we really do need. Like a couple of, an extra restroom. It'd be nice to have more than one. It'd be nice to have one that was handicapped accessible for people that do come, that can't get to there. Uh, we would like a place where we can sit down and all eat together, um, up to 100 people. A lot of for the funerals and things that we have done for our community that had to be elsewhere off-site because we don't have the facility to have a funeral here. And the one that we did do here, we made sure we were outside, thank the Lord, he gave us a really good day for weather. But it was very congested going up and down those stairs. Um, we want a place for kids to run and learn, a place to encourage them. When we do Kids Club, it's very difficult to do a game in our basement. If you've ever tried to do anything with that area, um, it's very difficult. It works outside, but outside in Minnesota is kind of a relative thing. You can only do it part of the time. And so we, we do a lot of games up here in the sanctuary, run around pews, but it does get a little dangerous, and we do have kids with bruises quite regularly. <laughs> so. But, you know, we, we want to be able to minister to children even better than we do now. We want to be able to continue to minister to our community. We want a place, like on Thanksgiving, where we can all sit down in the same area together and eat without having to wait for people to leave so that other people can sit down. So that's what we're looking for. We have been excellent stewards of all that God has already given us, and I believe that God has blessed us because of this. I believe that God will continue to provide the funds we need. He will use each of us, but He will show us creative ways to raise the funds and to put it on others' hearts to partner with us. This is no small thing. I do appreciate that. Yet I believe that it's the direction God is calling us to. I believe that we will soon be bursting at the seams. Maybe not today or next Sunday, but we've seen it and we know it's possible. We have seen it and we know too that that's God's will. We need to pray because he wants all people to be saved. He wants us to reach as many people as we can. We've had people, I've had people call me on the phone and ask me if we have enough room them to come. Because they see the cars in the parking lot and they assume we're a full house. So there are people already seeing that we're growing and they're concerned that there isn't room for them to come. Which I keep assuring them that we're still okay with that but it's still, it's kind of a sad thing. I don't know how many people are calling me and asking me that as they drive by. So that's a, you know, that's part of it. Part of it too is we need to, we want to reach our community. That's what God has called us to do. A church is not a church if it's just for ourselves. It's not about us. It's about all the people around us that don't know. It. That's what he's called us to do. He wants us to reach his community for him. He, we want people to know God and to grow in their faith, to show his love to others, and to go into their families and communities in the world and make a difference. So what's next? How can we do this? Well, first, the biggest and most important thing we can do is pray. Excuse me. <coughs> 
pray for the future of South Troy. One person shared with me after that January 31st, we had a vision and dreaming meeting downstairs a while ago. Um, one person shared, I'm concerned that we'll stop growing if we don't work on this expansion. Pray for each person involved with the details to make right choices and be good stewards. We want to do it right and we don't want to make mistakes. I mean, I'm terrible with that. I just, this isn't my thing. I've never built anything. I think the biggest thing I've ever built was a birdhouse. So, I have to admit, all I, I mean, I can do research and I can do all that stuff, and, and I like to find good professionals to do the numbers and all that stuff. But we need people, but we need to pray that we do it right. We also need a plan. We're going to need a building committee. We're going to need some people that come alongside, hopefully some, even with construction experience, that can help talk with a person that does blueprints, to talk with builders, to try to figure out what we need and to make the right resources. We need people to be involved. I said that for every volunteer on a Sunday morning, there are four more people that are coming to church. So the more people we can have serving, the more people, and that's been a proven ratio over time. Because if you think about it, when I counted out ours, that's about what it is. When we have, don't have very many volunteers, we have less people. When we have more volunteers, we've had more people. Because you tend to invite more people if you're serving. You intend to bring your whole family if you're serving. And all those kind of things. When you're part of the church, it just grows. And one of the other, we need more, um, we call it the WOW team, or we are starting to call it the WOW team. People in the parking lot. How many of you like it now that somebody's helping you park cars on Sunday mornings? Yeah, because there's no place, there was no place to go a few Sundays. It was disaster out there. And um, now we have three men that are helping. But we could use a few more. And it says uh, for new people and new attenders, they need five points of contact when they come into a church. Five. Me and Gary are two. And we shouldn't be the only two. And so we want we need more people to help greet and shake hands. And, and, and on the way out, they're supposed to have three points of contact. So it's a huge responsibility. Other than the stuff up, here, up front, that's the most important thing going on is those people visiting, you know, shaking hands and making people feel welcome. So we can always use new people for that, more people. Children's ministries, we need a, we should have an, one adult for every five students as we grow. And we'll need more people to reach more kids. Um, this summer we want to really emphasize our vacation Bible school. But we need more adults. We can't do it with just two or three of us. Because two or three of us, max we can do is about 20 children. We know there's more children in Zumbra Falls and Hammond that could come. And there's more in our communities as well. But we need more adults. We need people that are willing to pick up and take them home, too, because not all of them will come unless they have a ride. We need people to help with follow-up visitors and people to help the treasurer with counting money after services. We need people to become partners and leaders. We need prayer partners. We need people that are just really committed to praying for the ministry. And we'll need money, obviously. I hate, to, I hate to even bring it up, but that's something you have to have. Out. This is still very preliminary. We have no ceiling yet. We have no, you know, we need to get that kind of stuff ironed out, but we can always get started. There's never, we never can start too early. And we aren't asking you to do something that we aren't already willing to do. Our leadership team has already committed to $40,000 have been already donated towards the addition. So we feel very strongly as a leadership. It's not me and Gary. <laughs> so, but there's more than us on the leadership team. But that's already been a commitment made, is that much is already in the, in, for us, set aside. We really believe the Iowa-Minnesota district is also very on board. They're willing to give us a matching grant for what we do raise. So if we raise 50, I don't know if they'll put a ceiling on it, they could stop at 50000 But if they do, that will be $100,000 already debt-free. So God is already showing us that that's what he wants us to do. He's already starting to give us a fund. So we're pretty excited. I'm getting excited. I hope you can be excited too. Um, WIF is a Wesleyan Investment Foundation, and that's what they do. It's an international Wesleyan church, and they have all of they what money they have they give to other churches to help them to go. And so that's those funds. They have a really low interest rate, and our district superintendent he's very excited. He's very on board about this for us. He believes that's our next step as well, and he also. He was very 
resolute that she didn't think there'd be any problem with us getting a loan for the rest of it, for whatever the rest of it is. But obviously, we need to do our part as well. So that's where we're off. We're off to a great start. And the next thing we need to do is proceed. We need to get started. Every month or two, I, I plan to give you an update as we look toward the future for South Troy. We want our communication to be open. As you have concerns, feel free to call me. Feel free to talk to me. Take me. Don't do it on Sunday mornings. Because that's, I have to tell you, I forget every, I, Sunday morning is, this is my thing. And if I try to listen to, I, I can't do that on Sunday. But call me Monday, call me Sunday afternoon. Um, I'd be glad to meet with you. And you're welcome to any questions. You know, you know feel, you know, I love email. So I tend to answer those really good. Phone calls are good. Um, but yeah, I, I want to be open about all this. We don't want anything to, you know, to be out there where you can't understand what's going on. God has brought us this far, and He is going before us. He has been with us this whole time. We have so much to celebrate, so much to look forward to. We can see a vision that God has called us to, to know, grow, show, and go on the love of Jesus to our families, our communities, and our world. With men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you have done great things. And you will continue to do great things. You have done great things here at South Troy. You've already reached people's hearts and lives, and you've changed people already. And Lord, I know that's... That's what you made church for in the first place, is to be your hands and feet to the people in the community. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be willing to, to get out of the boat, to come to you and to follow you no matter what direction it takes. And Lord, we just thank you so much that you've already done so many things for us. And Lord, we just know that you have wonderful plans for the future. Lord, we lift up this church to you. Whatever direction you have it take. Lord, this is your church. It ain't about us. It ain't about me. And Lord, if I'm ever in the way, take me out. Lord, I just pray with my whole heart that you will continue to lead us and direct our paths, that we may be faithful to you, to do exactly what you called us to do. And Lord, we lay this all on the line before you this morning. And we ask you to watch over us in the days ahead. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As to, um, as actually, I forgot to share, in the bulletins, there's a little tab where the communication card is. And actually, I want you to be is a communication card. And I would love you to put your names on there and your address and your way to reach you, especially if you're uh, a, a new person or a guest this morning. But on the other side, there are things that you, know, that you can sign up for. And I, don't expect you to even get started on it today. I want you to go home and pray about it. Think about it. I don't want anybody to be impulsive. But I want you to be truly thinking about God, what God wants you to do. What, God, what you feel God wants this church to do in the days and years ahead. So. All right. Our announcements are... Oh, good. I didn't up there. <laughs> Next Sunday, um, it'll be about salvation. I thought it would grace. It's not just for meals. Um, Wednesday night is Kids Club and Conference. It's Friday night. Um, we have Super Night for 6th to 12th graders. We're going into Rochester. We'll meet here at the church at 9. It's supposed to be at the park and rec at 9.30, I believe. Um, right now, I think I'm going to need a driver. I think we have some.